Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of our technical team is going to have a word with you, short word, maybe. Hello there. Uh, I'm Ibi Yassin. I'm the uh, IT advisor for the Onyx Foundation. I've got a few quick words for you regarding the, if you open your packs, there's a small QR code in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and if you scan those QR codes, it'll take you to the Dropbox page where you'll be able to find all of the handouts that have been provided to us by the speakers today. Um, they may not be, you know, not all of the speakers have given us handouts, but for the ones who have, they'll all be there. And you'll also find a link to our website. Uh, very quickly, if you have a, an iPhone or any other Apple phone, then the way to scan the QR code is simply to open the camera app and hold it in front of the, uh, the QR code, and it will take you, after a short uh, note, it will take you straight to the page. If you have um, an Android, uh, specifically Samsung, you can open the Samsung Internet app, um, and if you press on the three, uh, three dots on the top right-hand corner, there's an option there to scan the QR code. For most other Android phones, um, you can download a small, very, very small application from the Google Play Store um, to scan the QR code. Literally type in QR code scanner, and almost every single one of those will work. Um, and, uh, and I'll finally end with this short note. Um, please, if it's possible, to make sure to turn off your, either to turn off your phones or to place them on silent. Um, and the reason for this is that not only is it, uh, would it be disruptive, but um, even if you place them on airplane mode, because of the internet here, you may still get Facebook and other social media notifications. Mm -hmm. So it's easier just to turn it off, either off or put it on silent. Yeah, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. May I also I draw your attention to <clears throat> this technology which is going. Actually, this um, conference, let me say, is live on the internet. There is uh, a channel that is taking it, but don't worry, we're not taking people. The, the speakers, I hope they, <laughs> they are going to, to be re ready to be famous. <laughs> this is going all over the world. Yeah. So also that is why actually the technicians, they, they say that even these small uh, notes, like when a message is, is received or sent, they affect the quality of the sound over there. Thank you. So <clears throat> we will continue our wonderful contributions today to our theme, One Humanity, Morality, and Home. And allow me now to introduce one of the big and really renowned world traditions in spirituality, in morality, in humanity, and contributed a lot to the welfare of all the world. It is by that spirit of one person who looked in the essence of the human being and then enlightened not only the continent, but all that region in East Asia, and now it is going global, and this tradition is Buddhism, and Allow me also to welcome <clears throat> our speaker to this. Um, Nagma Nuzdin Pamo. Did I say it right? <laughs> Great. And just to say to you, like, uh, I, I wish if you could explain the, the, the terms, because I'm very uh, fascinated by Nagma and Nagba. And I was looking for around for her husband, uh, who I met in their house when we went, myself and a colleague. And in fact, even though the, there is this small, let me call it, temple, however, it was for me like I have been on the top of Mount Everest in the Tibet <laughs> and enjoying all the warmth and the spirituality and the hospitality those words of uh, uh, the Bishop Cameron, in fact, they were there at everyone's um, feet, let me say. Everyone will enjoy that whenever they go to
to where these people actually gather together. They do their worship, they do their chanting, they do their gatherings. And I promised uh, one day I'm going to come. So without further ado, please welcome with me Nagma Nurdin Pamo for the Buddhist uh, perspective on one humanity, morality, and love. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Let me just put your presentation on. This is it, isn't it? Hello, everybody. It's very nice to be here. Nakma's my title, so my name is Nordzen. And I'm going to start by saying something about friendship and how friendship can be a, a, a method of enlightened activity. Because the people that we feel friendship for, who are close to us in our lives, we love those people and we care about those people. And we actually practice enlightened activity with those people because if they need help, we're immediately ready to offer it. If they're having a difficult time in their life, we're there for them. So in this way, friendship mirrors enlightened activity, but we don't find it easy to do that with everybody. <coughs> now, an image that is quite often used in the Eastern religions is a mandala. In Tibetan, this is called kilko. And I'm going to talk, base my talk around this idea of center and periphery in in Tibetan, the words kilko mean center and periphery. Now, usually our experience is that we're in the center of everything. We're the important thing. We are like a mountain. So I've used this image of a mountain. We have a very solid feeling about ourselves. We have views, opinions, beliefs. We're important. And there are peripheral places around us, represented here by four little rooms around us, but we feel very much at the centre. So in those rooms, there are people who are close to us. So there's a gap, there's a doorway to these rooms. So in the, get my directions right, in the west, there's a little picture of a baby that represents family family, people who are very close to us. So the doors are very much open to them. In the north, that one represents work and perhaps school. The place this is where you meet people and friendship is a possibility, but it's actually more likely that they are acquaintances rather than really close people. In the east, I've used, I think this is Albrecht Durer's wonderful uh, image of the praying hands and this is to represent whatever anybody's religion is or their spiritual belief or having no spiritual belief but everybody has some sense of spirituality even if they don't believe in a faith and in the bottom um, I've put some images of gardening to represent your likes and dislikes your activities in the world all of these are opportunities for friendship Now, what about a new room, a new connection to our kilko? We're there in the centre, and there's some other little mountain that we have the possibility of making contact with. So I have a little play for you now, a very short little play. So two people meet at the um, horticultural show, and person number one says... I love gardening. It's my passion. I absolutely adore it. And person number two says, so do I. It's my passion as well. This is looking good. They could become friends. This is very, looking very healthy. Person number one says, 
I have a large garden and my garden is full of vegetables. I grow all sorts of vegetables, all varieties. And it is so wonderful that I can feed nearly all my family. Person number two, messing my hair up, says, <laughs> I have a garden full of raised beds. And in these raised beds, I grow every variety of flower you could imagine. All the different colours, they're so beautiful. It brings such pleasure to the people who visit my garden. Person number one, I think it's completely irresponsible to use precious land for growing flowers. <laughs> flowers have no value at all. Flowers are just decorative. You need to use your land for growing vegetables. Oh. <laughs> so, although it looked promising to begin with, perhaps these people are not going to succeed in becoming friends. Now, I just ask you to think for a moment. Did you find yourself giving those people genders? I think gender is the first thing that you might have associated with those people. If you did that then that is a reflection of the filters that exist in our stream of consciousness that we may not even know are there, but those filters are continually making comparisons with past experience, continually judging and classifying everything that we experience. There are many, many I think somebody said something like nine million billion or something, was it, people in the world. And each of those is a little kielkor. Each of those thinks it is a mountain that is at the centre of everything. And there will be contacts. You can see that some of the doors are open between the different rooms of these different contacts. But some of them, the only contact is through another person. There is no direct contact with that. But this is the human condition. Uh, you can't really see in this light, but there's all, the background is also full of lots and lots of greyed out keel cores as well. So this is the almost feels infinite number of people. And all these people are potentially friends. But the reality is that most of them are not friends. And because we feel this sense of being a mountain in the centre, we feel that we have to kind of protect that. We have to be aware of the possible threat of a kilko that looks very different to our own, a mountain that's a different colour or a different religion or a different social network or whatever. Those are the dangers that prevent us opening our doors to everybody. This I'm calling a room stack. So this particular little room off the keel core is shared by lots of people. So this might be the sharing of a political opinion, of a religion, of an ethnic group, of a country, or something just as simple as sharing a love of gardening, sharing um, an interest in science fiction, stamp collecting, it could be anything. But because there are lots and lots of people in this room stack and you're sharing it with all these people, there's a danger there. I mean, it's a wonderful thing as well, but there's a danger that we allow that shared experience to become a source of feeling safe and secure and we start to feel that because this is shared by so many people therefore it must be truth and because this is shared by so many people but not you therefore you are wrong so when we have this stack of rooms of that are the same it's important to be aware of that potential danger there that the security you feel for it is borrowed security. You are actually no more secure than ever you were before. And not allow that to be a reason not to get close to people who don't share that with you. 
So now I'm going to look at the individual and I'm changing the image from a mountain to a diamond. What is a diamond? A diamond is clear and shining and transparent. A diamond lets everything into itself and it moves out through itself. A diamond has no colour of its own but can take on the colour of anything that touches it. But it doesn't, it doesn't retain that colour. The colour can just carry on through and be reflected. <coughs> so if we look at other diamonds in the four rooms in this image... We've lost the end of the word love. Sorry about that. <laughs> we could see that in the north, we all know that we all want to feel safe and comfortable physically and emotionally. That's something we can be sure about everybody. Even a person we might call an enemy. We can be sure that they still want to be loved and there are people who love them. We can know that. We don't need to question that. In the East, a need to love and be loved. We know that every being is loved by somebody. In the South, a variety of likes and dislikes. Everybody has likes and dislikes. We know that about human beings. We don't need to be told that. And in the West, we all have a variety of personal experiences, some good some not so good, some very sad, some very happy, and some of those we will share with other people and some we won't share with other people. Now, the qualities that come from those four aspects, it could be 400 aspects, but I've chosen four, come into the diamond-like self and colour it as we receive it. But the diamond remains a diamond. You don't let that become a filter. You let it become an ornament of the diamond, a quality that is appreciated and valued. And you reflect it back impartially without distorting it in any way. And so... We need to be diamonds and receive colour without prejudice. We need to re read, sorry, reflect and refract colour without prejudice, but remain luminescent, always capable to take on the colour that is offered us by other beings. Not to say, oh, I've become red. I've had lots of red stuff coming at me and I like the red stuff. So no, 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 I can't take any blue. I am a red diamond now. No, we want to stay clear so that red can be received and pink can be received and yellow can be received. The wonderful range that the universe offers us, we can receive it all. And we receive it, but we remain clear and empty and open to whatever we receive. We remain luminescent for everybody. And so I return to the image of friendship, but this time they've all got little diamonds in their hearts. They're all attempting to be empty and be luminescent and be free of prejudice. If everybody was, would embrace that, as a way of living, then friendship is always a possibility because you're not filtering what you receive through people by the colours that you fixed to your diamond. You can appreciate and enjoy whatever comes your way. Now, in your sheet, I thought I'd got one here, there's a little handout that I put in there. It looks like that. If you, if you want me to put it on the screen, I can do that on Oh. If you want it? Yeah, thank okay. you. I'll put it on the screen. I have it. Oh, excellent. I have it here, yeah. Okay. No. This one? Not this one, no. Okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. 
You have something? It's okay. A PDF. That's yeah, the that's one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can of course go down by just pushing like that. Okay. okay. That down okay. arrow. Okay. So this is a little game that I've devised that it says use a dice, but you don't have to. You can just decide, oh, I'm going to choose this colour. And it's a way of looking at how easy or difficult it might be to establish friendship and how there's the danger of, of establishing unfriendship, lack of friendliness, and also the danger of just being neutral. So in Buddhism, we, we have teachings that talk about the three objects, and these are friend, enemy, stranger. The problem of seeing, judging people in that way, and it's all self-referential. This person I am regarding as a friend because they support me in some way. This person I'm regarding as unfriendly. I always think enemy is a bit of a strong word, so I tend to say unfriendly. I'm unfriendly to these people because in some way they threaten me. They threaten my identity. And the third one is a stranger. And the thing there is I don't actually care. They pass across my life, but I don't care enough to take the time or the energy to, to actually uh, make contact with them in a friendly way. And our perception of beings as either friendly, unfriendly, or neutral creates what are called in Buddhism the three root misconceptions or the three poisons. So we're attracted to what is friendly, we're averse to what is unfriendly, and we're indifferent to what appears to be neutral. So what we need to develop in our diamond hearts is overcoming aversion and not caring and embrace, encourage attraction. What is there about this person that I can appreciate even though I don't feel drawn to them? What is there about this person that I can like even if it's just the colour of their jumper? <laughs> Find something to like and that neutralises that aversion that arises immediately. So it's quite interesting to play this game actually with somebody you know as the object of the game and find out perhaps why you are close or why you're not close or how you could possibly be closer. So I hope that's given you some thoughts and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like a presentation deck, I shall to show uh, who's, who's next. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this uh, interruption. Uh, coordination is <clears throat> my challenge at the moment. However, I don't want actually to waste re some reflections on what we have been listening to. And what a wonderful presentation and metaphors that bring very close the meaning without a lot of brain work. Thank you very much. Uh, for that, and also, um, I heard, I think, do you have any um, spiritual chanting contribution? We were talking about this at home. Anyone from your group or? Well, I, I have two of my students with you. If you Good. Something, if you would like. Yeah, just give it for me. I will find a slot for it surely. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh, uh, Professor Hassim is my timekeeper. What yeah, do you I think suggest? It would be, if you like, it would be good we hear the singing and then we go to another speaker so that they can link it together. So he's welcoming us. Ah, <laughs> oh, I love to see that. <laughs> So back to the stage. I'm looking for that. <laughs> right, I should say that I pinched her shawl because I forgot mine, so that's why she hasn't got a shawl. I'm coming undone. And and this gentleman is tone deaf, so we probably want you. Yeah, you can see. I still see. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Surely we, we don't want to miss that. <laughs> so lovely. Um, and now, <clears throat> actually, uh, allow me to introduce this tradition. And I think that is, to some extent, is the basic tradition for humanity from day one, nature getting to know the world around us, appreciate it as alive, enjoy it as resources, take it as home, and take also inspirations from its beauty, its stunning beauty. 
definitely there is a voice for that. And I think this tradition is listening to that voice and surely they came up with wonders that I would love we can share today in our conference some of this. So allow me to welcome um, Brewster's Jane, Gemma Jane Thomas, Thompson. I met her, actually, I have to tell this short story. I'm talkative, don't worry, excuse me. <laughs> but it is an interesting story. I met her, actually, in the community house in Newport, where, actually, she works really hard to help those people who are in need, who want to know, who want to connect to the bigger group, and also caring for all that is in need of care, to be honest. Because the first story I heard about is that this uh, group that cares about like strayed animals, once they found like a box with lots of kittens in it, and they didn't know where to take it. Thank you, um, uh, Marilyn, for tell, uh, telling me that, and also Ingrid sitting over there. They said that when they couldn't find an immediate carer, they tend to Gemma. They know that she, was, she will always care. And that was the beginning. So allow me to introduce her to share with us from that warmth of the heart and warmth of nature. Welcome to the stage, Kim. That was a very lovely introduction, thank you. <laughs> um, the kittens, yes, I, I do have a, a, it is not specifically a pagan thing, but I do have a weakness for taking on waifs and strays, which has left me in a very small house with nine cats, two dogs, ten snakes, and a lizard. Um, <laughs> so um, that wasn't so much something that I did deliberately. People just tend to bring them to me. I was, at the time that we had these little kittens, we had a group come to Community House, and um, there's a lovely lady in the audience now who likes to throw me out of the broom closet and say, this is our resident witch. And um, she said, would you get up and say a few words? And I stood up had a little chat and didn't realize that I was stood there with a little black cat. I couldn't have looked any more like a stereotype if I had tried. Um, so the first thing that I would like to do is just to break some of those misconceptions because were I to say to you the word witch or the word druid or the word magic, it is going to spark so many different ideas. Some of you are going to go, <gasps> some of you are going to think, God, she's a hippie. Um, there are so many different things, and the same as pretty much every single path in here, we have had more than our fair share of persecution down the years. Um, and that the same as most of our paths hasn't been necessarily because of what our religion practices. It's been about land, it's been about money, it's been about governments and kings. Um, what I practice, which is modern-day witchcraft is called Wicca. It is a religion which became popular in the 1940s after the repeal of the Witchcraft Act in the 17th century. Um, round about the 16th century, we had an awful lot of trouble. Um, and people who did practice the old earth religions went underground. Um, so I'm standing here on my own with nobody coming along as my delegates today. I do apologize. But there are still a lot of people who are very nervous about being out of the broom closet, as we call it. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what we do. Paganism is very, very old, and it's very, very new. We don't have the novelty of having a guidebook. We don't have a Torah or a Bible or a Koran that can tell us how our ancestors did it. So what we're doing, I have a, a quote here somewhere that... Um, paganism is a practice or a spirituality rooted in the ancient nature religions of the world. It's rooted there. That doesn't mean that we're doing exactly what we did. 
back then because we don't know. I would like to say I can stand at Stonehenge and I can do exactly as my great, 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 blah, 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 grandparents would do. We don't know. We've got clues. We've got ideas. What we do have is an understanding that as a people, we have moved so far away from nature that some of us are feeling the pull of nature to come back. Um, for me, I personally was underground for a fair few years. When I first started practicing a good 20 years ago, the thought of being invited here to speak or um, to Peace Mala where we were representing last year, any of these wonderful groups of people who are trying to get people together to understand that the crux of all of our ways really are the same, really are about loving each other and understanding each other and about being people. Um, I would have laughed if somebody would have said we could do that 20 years ago. So thank you all for, for being so open because I'm not going to lie, I was petrified doing this. I'm quite used to speaking at pagan events. Um, I'm a high priestess, I run a coven um, and I'm quite comfortable teaching my ways to the people who I know don't expect me to carry a broom and have green skin and sacrifice children. Um, I have two children. I've come this close several times, but that has nothing to do with my religion. Um, so on to really what it's about and how we're linking with humanity and morality and the earth. A gentleman in the 1940s called Gerald Gardner stepped forward and said, I am a witch. And many, many people went, he's clearly mad. Um, he had been in touch with a coven in the New Forest who had been practicing underground for a long, long time. Um, and he was lucky enough for them to bring him in and share his Book of Shadows. Um, it's not like it is in Charmed. We can't levitate things. I wish we could. Maybe back in Stonehenge's day when people were practicing what we call magic all the time, I don't know. And I'm saying magic, and people are going, hmm. Magic, the way that we understand it, is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. It's an understanding that, as Alistair Crowley said, I'm not a Thelemite. People have very mixed views, even in my tradition, of the work of Alistair Crowley. But he did come up with some little chestnuts of, of wisdom. It's being able to use your own energy to understand that, as he says, every man and woman is a star. To not feel small and insignificant. To be able to look at the wind and the wolf and the rain and the rainbows and say, hey, do you know what? I'm made of the same stuff as that. That makes me powerful. That makes me part of the divine, part of God or whatever we want to call it. Um, we believe that the divine is reflected in all of us. We believe that the divine is both masculine and feminine and that there is no great good and no great evil because our religion is based on nature. And on nature, there are beautiful, incredible things and there are heartbreaking, devastating things. And we will each see all of these in our lives. Um, and so for us, God is represented in all of those, in the, the dependence to have night, and day, to have woman and man, to have life and death. And we try to embrace all of those things. It's difficult because we live in a world where we are so far removed. I heard a gentleman speak a few years ago um, who was a death midwife, and I'd never heard of this before, but he talked about working with people at the end of their lives and um, taking people through the grieving process. In our modern day world, when somebody is sick, when somebody is birthing a child, everything is clinical, everything is wrapped away and, and tucked away. Um, I know it is specifically so in the Western world and that some of you come from countries where you are much more in touch with these life and death mysteries. Over here, we're not. We pack our dead off to the hospital and we don't see them again. They get wheeled off. Many of us have never seen a dead body. I was lucky enough, I say lucky enough, um, to be with my father through the end stages of cancer. And something clicked at that time for me where I was not a daughter grieving. I was a priestess singing him on his way. And that changed the way that I saw everything. So the crux for us of, of humanity really is to understand that everything requires balance, that we are all connected, 
that it doesn't matter where you are from or what you are from or what you practice. It's down to the walk that you walk. And if you can walk with your heart open, um, there's a, I should actually have brought a copy of it, but I've only just this second had the brainchild. But there is um, a beautiful poem by Oriah Mountain Dreamer called The Invitation. Um, I'll write it down for anybody who wants it later, or perhaps we can pop it on the website, which is about meeting people, talking to them through your soul, about not caring what people do, what, people do, what their job is, what their color is, but about can you look them in the eye and can they share their soul with you? Can they share their grief with you? Um, today's world where we've got our face in our mobile phone and we're swiping and we're liking and we're ranting, um, how often do we see people connecting on an eye-to-eye, soul-to-soul level? You sit on a bus and people have got their faces in their phone. Um, people are afraid of mud. This is not a stereotype that is without roots. We are little mud bunnies, pagans. We like to get out there with our bare feet and get into the mud and connect with that earth energy um, because it's so important. When was the last time you walked outside with no shoes on and just felt that connection? Um, we are biological creatures, but we're not, we're not surviving on that. Everything we eat is processed. Everything that we do is processed. So paganism, for me at least, is to get back to those roots, to be able to, to feel where we're coming from and where we're going to, inevitably. Um, I went on a walk with my children a while ago, and it struck me as ridiculous. We were walking, and I thought, what is that smell? And it was wild garlic. And I was over the moon. I went and I picked some garlic with my children, and we went home, and we were like, oh, my gosh, wow, look, we're making a salad with stuff that we've picked from the earth. And then I thought, well, how ridiculous is that, that this is the first time as a family that we have gone into the forest and found something that is provided by the gods for us instead of Tesco's or something like that. And it really made me think, okay, this is something that we do, we do as part of our practice, study herb law, we study alternative medicine. Um, I'm a Reiki healer as well, although that's not specifically pagan. But learning where the medicine and the the stuff that is provided there for us in this this wonderful incredible savage garden that we live in um morality we have something called the wiccan read in my particular path now as i said i'm a wiccan modern day witchcraft we also have druids we have shamans we've got native americans we've got basically any religion that is a non abrahamic multi um a polytheistic religion, we class as pagan. That comes from the Romans, maybe in the fourth century. Um, pagan comes from Pagani, the country dwellers. The Romans would come into a country and they would bring their religion and they would convert the people who were in the cities. But the people out in the countryside, the country dwellers, they were still following the old gods. And um, in Wales specifically, you can go into some of the very, very old churches and you can see little green men or hares carved into these old churches where the people who were unconverted at that time felt that they needed to, to make their own little mark so that they also could worship in these places. Um, we do not have one temple. We did many, many, many years ago when we were Greeks and Romans and all pagans. Um, and then everybody tried to throw each other to the lions and burn each other. And, you know, <laughs> everybody has done it at some point. This is not specific to witches. Um, so now we do something called casting circle because we believe that every part of the earth is sacred. Every part of the earth is for us we go to a place and we will symbolically cleanse it with salt and with water and with incense because we work very much with the elements and we believe that we are made from the elements and part of them. And we will draw a circle and we will say, for tonight, this is our temple. And we will invite our gods to come to us and that is where we will pray and we will dance and we will sing and um, we will be joyful because that is how we try. Um, we, the, the charge of the goddess says, all acts of love and pleasure are our rituals. That said, morality, we do not have one thing telling us what we should be doing. We do have the Wiccan read, which is an it harm none, and being from the, the slightly older English meaning if, if it harms none, do what you will. When we talk about will, we're not necessarily saying want. We're not saying do what you want. We're talking about 
what we refer to as our higher will, the will that is some, some marrying of free will and our destinies, something that is our sole purpose. And it is impossible to wander through the world harming none. We do it as best we can. For me, that means um, a vegan lifestyle. I don't consume anything that comes from animals. Um, but you can't live without damage. I also have snakes who I have rescued who cannot survive on tofu alone. So I have to take the lesser of two evils there, and I have to feed them what they need to survive. Um, but as far as practical in my own life, I try to cause as little damage as I can. We all do it in our own ways, whether that means eating organic or walking when you could take the bus. It's something that we all try to do in our own way, and it's something that runs as a vein through pretty much every path. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You know, be kind to people. Don't hurt people on purpose. We have something called the threefold law. Everything we send out will come back three times. It's karma, baby. And it is real. What we send out, it comes back at us. Whether it comes back with a smile, we walk down the road, we smile at somebody, they're going to smile at somebody else, and suddenly you've got this wonderful pay it forward. Or you wake up in a rotten mood and you make somebody cry. And then for the rest of the day, they're going to be miserable and they're going to make other people sad. We take that as far as energy goes as well. Yes, there are people who practice what we call witchcraft and will use that for bad ends. They will curse, they will hex. Everybody's heard of the medicine women, um, the people who every culture has who will do things for a negative reason. That makes no sense as far as modern day witchcraft goes. Why would you do that? At some point it's going to come back and it's going to bite you on the backside. So we heal. We do what we can using energy, using plants, using a smile, just to bring a little bit of love and light into people's lives. Um, so that's about as far as we go on morality. Nothing says you can, you can't. Nothing is considered sin. If you can do what you do, and you can justify it to yourself and to your higher will, and you are causing as little harm as you possibly can, really you can't go far wrong. But it is impossible to, to completely be harmless. And I know we're not the only group of people who try. Um, but it's, it's a tough old thing, and people often beat themselves up for, oh, today I did this, today I did this. Um, home and the earth. Well, really, I think I've said that. Um, we come from the earth. We are natural, organic creatures. She provides to us. It's time that we started providing back. In, in the last couple of hundred years, since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of damage that we have done to this planet, to each other, the amount of man-made diseases. Um, in South Wales, I believe one in three children are clinically obese. That's not because they have a hormonal imbalance. That is because we are not eating properly. We're not getting out there and connecting with nature. We're, not, we're, we're living this sedentary lifestyle where we're having food that is processed and, and so unnatural. Um, and it's doing us as much harm as it's doing the planet. The crux of what we do is microcosm and macrocosm. When we are in a circle and we are doing what we call making magic, whether it's... Um, having a little dolly of somebody. Yes, we do do that, but we don't tend to stick pins in it. Instead, we tend to fill it with lovely energy. We might actually make a doll with a pin in it and symbolically pull that pin out if somebody has an ailment, if they have a problem. You can make that doll and you name it in front of the gods and then you raise energy by dancing or chanting and you say, right, okay, I want you to see this little thing here. I want you to see this as my friend Margaret and she has terrible arthritis in her shoulder and this pin, this is the pain that she's in. And then you would do what you do. You would raise that energy, and then you would say, right, I want, when this pin comes out, I want that to help her. Some people believe in it. Some people don't. But magic is, I would say, a good 60% psychology. If you say to somebody, you are blessed, you are going to have a wonderful day, they're going to walk around thinking, I've had a wonderful day. If you say to somebody, do you know what? I'm going to lay a curse on your head right now. The next time they stub their toe, the next time they trap their finger in the car door, they're going to believe that it is this negative energy. And so it grows. 
where really you might not have lifted a finger at all. Um, so I completely lost my train of thought there. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, that's where we're at. Um, taking some responsibility and trying to, to give back as much as we've taken. It's a, a slow process. I would like to end on a visualization. Um, I've talked about how we raise energy, how we, we make change happen in a small way to make it happen in a big way. What I would like to do, have I got time for a quick five minute thing? Amazing. It'll be really quick, I promise. Okay, if I can ask you to just close your eyes and be comfortable for a minute. And I just want you to have a nice deep breath in and become really aware of your spine, nice and straight. And as you're breathing in, I want you to feel your spine coming down right into the earth. Your body is like a tree and I want you to feel your roots going down right into the earth and I want you to feel you sucking up all of the nutrients Feel that lovely earth energy filling you up. And then I want you to reach those roots a little bit further. And I want you to become aware of all the other roots that are down there. The roots of the people sitting next to you. The roots of the people further away. They are all together in one solid ball of roots inside this earth. They are all coming from the same place. When you are breathing this energy in, you are sharing that heartbeat, that wonderful, wonderful primordial womb that we've all come from. You are no less and no more a part of that around you than the person next to you or the raging storm or the sea. You are made of the elements. And now I would like you to join me very gently in a little chant. We believe that when we sing together or when we chant together, it helps us to connect. So it might take you a couple of times to get the words, but it is earth, my body, water, my blood, air, my breath, and fire, my spirit. And when you're ready, Please feel free to join in, and we'll just do it a few times just to feel that connection. Earth, my body, water, my blood, air, my breath, and fire, my spirit. Earth, my body, water, my blood, air, my breath, and fire, my spirit. Earth, my body, water, my blood. Air my breath and fire my spirit, earth my body, water my blood. Air my breath and fire my spirit, earth my body, water my blood. Air my breath and fire my spirit, earth my body, water my blood. Air my breath and fire my spirit. When you're ready, just take a nice deep breath. Take a look around at the people that you are connected to and enjoy the rest of your day. Blessed be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. خليني انسخ لك القران ولا كيف؟ ها؟ ما عايزين نوسي؟ اي بنسخه عندي اي بنسخ اي بس انا اي جاست وونت تو اوكي <laughs> Wonderful, yeah.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, ready for you. Right. Okay. 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 Okay, I think that was very rich and real, let me say. We had a wonderful experience going back to our roots. And surely, in my tradition, it says, from it we created you, and on it, like we reared you, and to it you are going back, and from it again you will be resurrected. So Mother Earth, and I doubt, I, 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 I don't doubt that no a spiritual person, no anyone would not feel the love for the mother, because that is natural. So actually, because of the time closing to the lunch, uh, we are going to split the Muslim presentation into two. The recitation is going to be now, then we break for the lunch, and then later we will have the presentation if you don't mind. So may actually I introduce um, the author of the Muslim paper, Sheikh and Imam Muhammad Tulba. He's an Egyptian. He graduated from Al-Azhar in Cairo, that grand institution and the first university on earth. And he had the privilege of learning the Muslim traditions and texts and sacred texts with all the spectrum from renowned scholars in Al Azhar University. <coughs> and he also had the privilege in studying most of his studies in English over there, has been teacher over there, and also an imam here in United Kingdom, first in Wales. And I think that was during the time of late Sheikh Said, who is known to all the community. Also, he went to Brighton and for seven or for a couple of years, let me say, and then came back to South Wales Islamic Center. He's going to share with us a beautiful recitation from the Holy Quran. So welcome, Sheikh, and the stage is yours. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنسى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض ودعها للأنام صدق الله العظيم Okay. Thank you very much, Sheikh. <coughs> In fact, these verses are the verses that he quoted on the paper that is going to be after lunch, and uh, and brother. Mr. Muhammad Bilal Ali is going to uh, deliver it. So we will be looking forward to that. And now, actually, we will finish this session and head to the uh, restaurant for the lunch break. And I would like, actually, to suggest if we could have it less than an hour, maybe like 50 minutes. I want those 10 minutes, if you don't mind. <laughs> you are generous, I know. Thank you very much for being here. You have enjoyed the spiritual, the religious, and nature, and all the wonders. And I hope now you will enjoy the food. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>